Jackson. Um, regrettably, I'm going to be doing it alone. Mr. Suter finds himself unable to join me for this particular lesson, so you'll have to listen to my dulcet tones carry on about class differences and racial variation in prosperity in the late 19th century United States of America. Now, of course, in all things, for building a top level answer in both the 10 and 20 mark questions, it's really important that we do not generalize at A level. We say things, for instance, like there were differences in class, there were differences in your experience based on your race. And the students who are able to do that to form a better answer will reach the higher levels of the mark scheme. So we focus on that today. So the different areas that you should think of, okay, we think of the Northeast, the primary primarily industrial areas. The Great Lakes, okay, around the rust, what becomes known as the Rust Belt because of the large amount of steel and eventually later car production. The Great Lakes cities of Detroit, Cleveland, Erie, Pennsylvania, and Buffalo become major industrial centers. You get the Midwest, the primary city in the Midwest is Chicago, which is a major hub of the meatpacking industry. You get the emerging West Coast cities uh, formed on trade with the Pacific, but also um, as agricultural sort of outports. So a lot of the grain and so forth grown in the West ends up on, in the West Coast. And then you have to talk about the South. Um, south, the predominantly agricultural area had not moved dramatically in terms of what it produced and, and, and it's the experiences uh, of its people since the end of the Civil War. Hardship prevailed all the way through the time of Reconstruction and that continues into the Gilded Age. The further south you go into what's sometimes known as the Deep South, <clears throat> you'll have all sorts of differences which will affect both race, class, and... Um, uh, yeah, race, class, and the sort of the, the difference between a southern and northern urban and rural situation needs to be considered. Now, let's first talk about the middle class. One of the things you have in the Gilded Age is really the emergence of the middle class. Um, the Carnegies and the Rockefellers and all of these people sort of lead the way for the wealthy. Um, there's, a no, as we know, a new, a new upper class created, a phenomenally wealthy and affluent upper class. On the other hand, you've got to contrast the upper class and what most people do very well is, is contrast them with the struggling poor. And don't give really credence to the fact that the Gilded Age also spawned something new in American history, that is the emergence of the middle class. The professional class emerges because of the nature of not only education in America at this time, but the nature of the jobs and the roles created by this new modern industrial society. And we get the, what's known as the rise of the professional class, the middle class, okay? These are people who, based on things like their degree of education, um, higher education that they have, or being part of a group such as uh, a lawyers or a teachers associations or whatever it happens to be, therefore get associated with the middle class. And the middle class will have a dramatic impact on changing the social history of the United States. It is the middle class, ironically, and you'd think as they climb the ladder, they'd be more akin to re um, relating to the upper class. It's the middle class that, for two reasons, actually have an influence on improving lives of the working class quite dramatically in, the, let's say, the late part of the 19th century, but most certainly in the early part of the 20th century. Um, so what characterizes this emerging middle class in the Gilded Age? You have, first of all, um, a small number of people. Number, okay, There is a middle class, but it's no more than 10% at any point um, before the turn of the century. And that's 10% of all of the sort of uh, the people in the United States. The middle class, by comparison, has fewer children. Um, a couple of reasons for that. Number one, medical care. They can afford it. And as a result, the infant mortality rate decreases. Not only that. Um, in reality, there are fewer children needed by the middle class. Um, there is, in many cases, particularly amongst rural communities, a need for having children for extra hands on the farm. The middle class enjoy more leisure time. They become the, some of the biggest consumers of entertainment, both in the theater and professional sport. One of the big things that emerges at this time is baseball is sort of a... Um, a sort of a pastime of the middle class, uh, something that they like to go see in their spare time. Uh, the middle class usually has higher education. Um, they're they take advantage of the, the increase in schooling and opportunity in the United States and put not only themselves through it, but ensure that their kids get a primary, secondary, and most in most cases, a college education. 
the middle class will also lead to the expansion of the cities. Um, the middle class is keen to use their newfound wealth comparative to the poor to buy on the outskirts of the cities. And they really, it's a new um, it's a new emerging middle class that leads to the creation of the suburbs. These people could afford to move. They could afford the transportation into the city every day. And therefore, as a consequence of their being able to move, they get more privacy uh, and are able to have a good degree more of affluence because moving outside of the city tends as well to be available and also tends to be a bit cheaper. Okay, So what leads to the growth? Um, I've met, mentioned this already, but more, more importantly, there's a huge growth in education. Okay, More regulations on schools mean more children were completing high school. Okay, These, The fact that a lot of students weren't able to leave until after, let's say, the age of 12, for instance, uh, means that more children in, in America are literate and they're completing uh, further education. Colleges... And there becomes a relatively widespread um, growth in colleges at this time, leads to a middle class that's very, that's very professional, the professionalization of the middle class. Um, the birth of colleges begins also a training program for professionalization. You get teacher training, for example. Um, colleges also enhance a level of prestige associated with positions. So you get sort of the, the notion of, you know, um, lawyers, teachers, all being part of associations, people who have to achieve something in university in order to become and and to enter into the middle class. So whereas teachers before were just sort of the, the literate person in town taught in the one room schoolhouse, now you have a literate, um, highly professional class of teachers. And as a teacher, of course, I'm, dr I'm drilling on about teachers, but you see this in all, t all sorts of different professions. Another good example would be accountants. Accountants before tended to be people who were good at maths, could be trained up within a, within a um, within an organization. During the Gilded Age, there is actually specialized training programs for accountancy and tax management. And as a, a result, people join organizations like the sort of Organization of Chartered Accountants of America. And these organizations lend prestige because of the degree of training and education you need to get into this sort of elite club of accountants. And what you get as a consequence of education is this very much a professionalized, um, normalized middle class. The other thing that increases the middle class, of course, is managerial roles. The increasing sort of um, size and scope of industry means that, you know, the people who are doing these jobs need managers to manage the different aspects of a factory. So, for instance, if you're a factory manager, you may be the manager of the receiving department. Um, it, your job, therefore, is to ensure that all of the employees do what they want, but also ensure that the company is receiving all of the goods that they need to produce X product, okay? Um, that's just one example. Industrialization and the sort of mechanization of labor and the increase in sort of the, the size of the industrial working class means that you also need managers to regulate those days. The, the bigger the company, the more managers you need. And these people earn more and oftentimes are chosen from those amongst the population who had a specialized education, such as a degree in sort of business management, for instance. The middle class has an enormous impact, okay? First and foremost, it leads to, and this you need to consider this very greatly, so put a star beside this, um, the growth of the progressive movement, okay? The middle class is high, highly literate, and they're highly articulate articulate, which means that they buy and digest literature at a massive rate. It is no surprise that during the end of the Gilded Age, the proliferation, that word means the spread of, in large quantity, of newspapers and the printed word in form of informative magazines, um, journals, etc., um, increases quite dramatically. And the middle class is reading more than any other group. Um, in really in American history at this point. They're consuming literature at a massive scale. And as a result, they consume what's sometimes known as muckraking literature. And muckraking literature are investigative journalists who look up and try to write articles on the problems in society. They look for problems. They rake the muck, if you will. Hence the term muckraking. That's a term coined in 1906 by Theodore Roosevelt, but it gets equally applied. They, they read investigative journalism. Okay, And as a result, they become very concerned about some of the things these investigative journalists are talking about, particularly the plight of the rural poor and the industrial working class. And therefore, the middle class, because of their newfound literature and understanding of what's going on around them, 
become highly politically active and they have and begin to have influence in a voting block. These are people who, un, you know, very unsurprisingly, when you consider what they're reading, start to vote for progressive policies, policies that promote change for the betterment of the industrial or the, um, the rural working classes. Okay, they are in fact, and this is also an important consideration, closer to the bottom than they are to the top, and therefore their demands will be more in keeping with that of the industrial working class rather than, let's just say, that of the big business. They tend to lobby against big business and lobby for improvements in poor housing in the inner cities. They will lobby against the evils of drinking and prostitution and things that, of course, I sort of a high-minded individual individual would find immoral or improper. Um, the middle class also has a dramatic impact on the building and expansions of institutions of higher learning. At the turn of the century, in the late 1880s and 1890s, you get, again, I'm going to use the word proliferation of American universities. Because of the demand for specialized in education increases because of the rising middle class and the need for their children to receive these types of educations, you also get uh, institutions of higher learning springing up all over the United States of America to train people in the fields of law, medicine, journalism, and all sorts of other ones. And of course, these places create the professional organizations to monitor those entering uh, professional fields. Not only that, there are laws passed as a result of the lobbying of the middle class for government. And these laws uh, grant land for the development of colleges. There are two. Um, um, uh, there is the Morrell Land uh, College Land Grant Act of 1892. It's probably the biggest one, and that gives free land to any institution wanting to um, provide an institution of higher learning. So it allows for American uh, um, uh, universities to access free land and, and then develop. And actually, if you look at a lot of the um, <coughs> the universities in America, a lot of them trace their founding to this particular point. There was, of course, the first initial group of colleges known as the Ivy League, and the Ivy League proliferates in this era, in this era to become um, quite a bit more uh, larger. I mean, basically, many of the major colleges and institutions in the United States are founded in this period. Effectively, that's all I'm trying to say. Um, here's a good idea of some of the things created in the various land grant acts, 1892 and um, 1890, you see, for instance, in red, very much the spread of higher institutes of higher education. Uh, the stars indicate uh, the secondary ones that come up in the Second Land Grant Act of 1890. Um, I mean, really, it reads as a who's who of top American universities. Another consideration you need to make when going for the top levels of the Marx scheme is you have to talk about the racial variation in prosperity. And it is very true to say that in the United States of America, even though that black people particularly were made free at the end of the Civil War in 1865, they did not share in the prosperity um, seen by many Americans in the Gilded Age. Uh, the major reason for that is after the period of Reconstruction, and between 1865 and 1877, the federal government takes a very proactive role in ensuring that the South comes back into the Union. And after 1877, however, the federal government sort of backs out of the South due to political pressure more than anything. The South resented the American federal government's dominance over what they considered um, uh, issues to do with um, uh, states' rights, if you will. So in 1877, the government backs down. After 1877, it is the states themselves that are left to uphold the changes in the Constitution that had been made in 1865 that had granted equality to black people. The next 40 years become incredibly difficult for black people. The states, let alone by the federal government, their policy of laissez-faire and the fact that the federal government sort of very much takes a hands-off approach in the Gilded Age means that the states in the South um, can really start to begin to pass laws that discriminate against black people in very, very severe ways. Um, it is very important to remember that the Civil War does not end racism and it does not end bigotry. Um, as a result, the states in the South and communities within those states in the South enforce disenfranchisement. And disenfranchisement means the loss of voting rights. They try to strip black people of their ability to better themselves through the political process by removing their ability to vote for um, 
those who represent them. They also, because the black people are limited in, uh, in who they can vote for, enforce what's known as social separation. A number of laws, which we'll talk about in a second, known as the Jim Crow laws that are passed that basically mean that black people and white people live in the same areas of, of the United States of America, but they exist in separate spheres. Additionally, the white people are free to, because the states are not upholding laws that oppose black people, use violence to keep black Southern Americans from achieving any degree of prosperity or any degree of equality. The idea of lynching in the United States becomes, um, uh, or the, the notion of lynching, that is hanging black people for perceived crimes, uh, sometimes uh, just as much as talk a black man talking to a white girl, um, could end up with a mob showing up beside your house and you being hung from the nearest tree. Now, it's important to remember that the 15th Amendment to the Constitution said that no one should be denied the right to vote by reason of race. Um, this was not upheld in states. The best example is South Carolina, and the statistics speak for themselves. In a short 16-year period, there's a drop of almost 60% in the number of blacks who actually vote in elections. Okay? States found ways to interpret laws to reflect racist beliefs by forcing blacks to register for to vote, um, which made restrictions uh, such as, for instance, Georgia charging black people a $2 fee to vote. Now, for black people who are mostly sharecroppers and did not earn very much money, a $2 fee to vote was absolutely something they couldn't afford. And forcing black people to choose between being able to buy food to feed their family or vote in the next presidential election sees the amount of black people who vote fall off dramatically. Secondly, uh, another good example is the state of Louisiana passes in the Gilded Age what's known as a grandfather clause. Um, if It says that if your grandfather was an eligible voter before 1867, you could vote i.e. Uh, the last federal election being the election of Abraham Lincoln, which was held in 1860, um, means that in the South, only white people voted in 1860. So if your grandfather voted and was white, you could vote, which means that black people are completely disenfranchised. They have no ability to vote in the state of Louisiana, and consequently, Louisiana then elects extremely racist, extremely, well, obviously, very obviously white people who do and seek to further the separation of blacks and whites in the South. So what you have is, in a, in a sense, slavery by another name. And obviously this has a dramatic effect on prosperity. Few Southern blacks are able to vote. Um, very few can become political leaders as a result of these laws. And as a result, the concerns of the black community and the problems with the black community are not represented in government and therefore nothing can be done about them. Um, the reinforcement of the image of the black person being inferior is done tacitly by the acceptance of these laws, okay? These laws enforce the notion of white superiority, okay? That whites will be the ruling class and blacks will be the, at the best, the servant poverty class. Southern blacks will also, as a result of all of this, basically accept that the situation was hopeless. And they really did feel that it was impossible to change things, and it more or less was, okay? Um, and a lot of Blacks accept that this is the way it's going to be, but at least it was a little bit better than slavery. Now, one of the reasons you might be saying to yourself is, why didn't they just leave? Well, of course, picking up and leaving is expensive, and Black people don't have the economic means, they don't have the education to succeed in the North, uh, even if they did. Now, the Supreme Court couldn't have forced the 15th Amendment because there was no political pressure to do so. And the Supreme Court can only rule on cases that are taken to it. It cannot go out and actually enforce laws. You have to take laws to the Supreme Court. And because nobody wants to enforce this or cause problems with the South, particularly in the North, and no one in the South wants to change the laws that are working to benefit white supremacy, absolutely nothing happens. And very little will happen until realistically, in the 1930s, 40s, and then into the civil rights era of the 1960s. So overall, you get economic, political, and racial discrimination, okay? Um, there is no land redistribution in the South following the Civil War. It meant that blacks had to work for others, okay? The land wasn't taken away from those white slave owners, okay? They were just allowed to keep their land, and now they just had to employ people to work on their land. 
As a result of that, the Blacks have no way really to better themselves. The only thing they can do is work as sharecroppers or tenant farmers on the land that they used to be enslaved on. It's really a, a kind of a very depressing state. Not only that, the South was comparatively poor to the North, and therefore it's pretty hard to convince people that ending slavery was anything but a bad thing for the South. And as a result, the South, the Southerners are really, on economic grounds, also unwilling to consider changing. The economic panics of 1873, for instance, will convince many people that the problem of the economy was structural, and in fact there was little problems with inequality. So even though the economic panics cause alarm, they actually convince people in the South that the, the problems were actually at the federal government level, and that black people could better themselves unless if the federal government decided to change. Not only that, you need to consider why don't blacks up and leave, you got to consider that violence, social discrimination, being disenfranchised undermines your confidence okay and as a result they are unable to pursue their ambitions or unwilling to in many cases and assert their rights to individual economic uh, prosperity so overall black farmers in the south had a particularly bad time and it's always good to differentiate between the degree to which black farmers had it worse than the white farmers if you're searching for the top levels of that mark scheme a couple other considerations I want to make briefly. Number one, there's societal discrimination. They had talked about lynching, and here we have a very disturbing and dramatic picture. Between 1889 and 1918, you need to remember that 2,558 black men were lynched. That's nearly 100 a year. And virtually none of the murders were tried and convicted. Okay? Um, the amount of lynchings will slow after 1918, but the fact that lynching remains a central feature of American Southern life uh, right up until 1864 and the passing of the Civil Rights Act, which will put incredibly harsh punishments on anyone convicted of lynching or seen in the process of lynching, like all of these people would be in jail, for instance, after the Civil Rights Act, um, means that it doesn't really go away. And the fear of violence, if you get to, and to use a term that they use quite frequently, uppity, which means that you sort of want to um, up your place in society, um, if you get too uppity, the, the threat of violence is always there. So a lot of people don't because they're truly just terrified. A um, couple other things. 90% of black people will live in the South in 1900, and therefore the societal dim uh, discrimination um, uh, is important. Okay, And I said, you know, sort of repetitive, but a lot of these farmers relied on sharecropping or they became domestic service uh, servants for their employment. White attitudes are, are reinforced by social Darwinistic views. And of course, there are several court cases which will enforce um, black dominance. A couple things, uh, a couple ones that may be mentioned or you could mention if you're wanting to be really specific. You can talk about in 1896 what's known as the Plessy versus Ferguson ruling. And in the Supreme Court case of Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court rules that discrimination between blacks and white peoples and the provision of services, that is, the provision of education, uh, a white school and a black school, is legal as long as they're separate but equal. And in reality, that's read by the southern states, is that we are allowed to discriminate. We can create black schools and we can create white schools as long as when we create them, they're equal. How that's interpreted and what that what effect that has long term is quite interesting because even though the schools are built to be the same equal, which is in keeping with Plessy versus Ferguson, the white school will be maintained. Well, the black school will have the worst teachers. Uh, it will have all of the um, uh, say it won't have any books. Okay, but the building itself is equal. The building will be allowed in the black case to fall into disrepair, but in the white case it will be maintained to the highest standard. As a result, black and white education differs very greatly. It becomes impossible to attract good teachers to black schools. Not only that, because many Southern whites won't teach in a black school, it also means that, you know, if you can't teach without books, it becomes quite difficult. Um, the culmination of all of the Plessy versus Ferguson ruling leads to um, what becomes known as the Jim Crow laws. And there's no one thing, I'm Jim Crow and I'm going to pass these laws, but the Jim Crow laws are a name for a series of laws passed in various southern states which create a biracial society. It means the approval of segregation, and it does encourage the gradual flow of black workers to the industrial north, which really takes place um, more in the 1920s than it does in the Gilded Age. One last word, um, there's another group you should consider, the Native Americans. 
By the 1890s, the Native Americans, the original habitants of the American uh, continent, had been defeated by the United States Army. The expansion westwards, much, much of it led by the United States Army, had um, pushed Native Americans onto reservations, areas designated in the United States to be Indian land that was untouchable to white settlers. Um, this was a dramatic change in their lifestyle. Most Native American tribes tended to be nomadic. Well, that means that they don't actually have a solid home. Okay? They don't exist in one particular place. They follow their food sources. You know, in the West, they chase the buffalo. And the Native American tribes would set up their camps nomadically uh, one day, follow the buffalo, set it up another day, and they live their lives like this. And as a result, when they were forced into the reservations, tribes and the people who were the native people had no idea how to live in a single singular place. They didn't have the concept of American farming. They didn't understand the European idea that you live in a town. And as a result, they were left struggling for food. And what ends up happening with a lot of Native Americans is they have a terrible experience as they're forced to assimilate, which means blend into the white community. And Americans uh, will set out into the West to try and assimilate. And a lot of laws will be passed <clears throat> which encourage the end of sort of communal ownership of land. And we'll try to get the Native Americans to break down the way they viewed their society and live more like white people. The biggest one of that was the Dawes Civilality Act of 1887. And this encourages tribes away from this uh, communal land ownership where they sort of work together and each family is given an individual plot of land. Um, the reserve lands are sold at five cents an acre to people that, um, and, or settlers that want to buy it. And as a result, in this forced assimilation, not only do they lose what they had in terms of the reserve lands, the natives are forced to assimilate into a culture they don't understand, they don't appreciate. And this has all sorts of terrible social problems. So the late... Apart from being hunted like wild animals by the U.S. Army, the Native Americans in the United States have a very difficult time. Their land policy um, actually takes governance away from Native Americans and gives it um, to the federal government. Because once you accept the land, you have to accept the rules of the old dominant country, that is the United States, or particularly the state in which you lived in. Not only that, the reserve lands, un, you know, unsurprisingly, when you consider the white racism that was sort of predominated, the, the need for American Native Americans to assimilate into the dominant culture, it underlies the fact that they also gave them the worst land, okay? Which means that even if they did adapt to farming, much of the land was unproductive and nothing would grow on it, which made the Natives completely reliant on government handouts. And when you're reliant on government handouts, Okay, you become dependent and you must do as the government says. And this really destroys the native way of life in America in a very, very profound way. Um, you have all sorts of other problems. For instance, native groups that had traditionally been hostile to each other, enemies, for instance, who had warred against each other for thousands of years in the Great Plains, for instance, because the white people didn't understand uh, the history, nor did they care to learn the history of the native people. These people were put together um, in reservations where these reservations are rife with you know, multi-generational conflicts, et cetera, et cetera. Not only that, as America spreads westward, the demands of white farmers, settlers, and miners who see that perhaps, perhaps there could be, you know, a gold deposit on Indian land or coal on an Indian land or oil on Indian land, as was the case in Texas, means that white settlers who are listened to, as opposed to the native settlers who are not, um, start to put pressure on government to give us the native reserve lands. And the governments actually backtrack on, the, on a lot of the native reserve lands that they were giving to the natives. And as a result, the natives soon lose the land that they were given after they lost their land once again. So even things, uh, as is the inappropriately named Friends of the Indian Movement, will start to force Americans to adopt, or Native Americans to adopt white culture. And what we have here is a very sad story of Native Americans who live in many cases side by side to the whites, being forced to adopt white culture, a culture that doesn't understand that destroy, that really in effect destroys Native American society. So as we can see, in both the cases of black Americans, Native Americans, and the emergence of the middle class, that things in the Gilded Age are not black and white. It is important that you consider the lessons of this lesson when you're making your answers so that you achieve nuance in your answers and that they are the best they can be.